Good Monday morning of the 18th, uh, 18th uh, uh, Sunday, uh, 18th week of the year. As you can see, I'm, re I'm wearing my red, uh, my red T-shirt from St. Uh, Nicholas Parish in uh, Alaska. <laughs> Do you see it? This is that's the T-shirt. So, so I forgot who gave it to me. Somebody from the parish. I don't know if it was Ann. I think it was. Anyway. And wearing their t-shirt, my Alaska t-shirt, okay? And the readings today is interesting. I could, it's not Alaskan reading. It really strikes me as New England reading, to be honest. And it's the famous story about Peter walking on the water. You remember? And he said, I mean, when it was evening, he, this is Matthew's gospel. This is uh, chapter 14, 22, 30, 22 to 33, okay? He said, uh, meanwhile, when it was evening, he was uh, there. Excuse me, after. Ah, <laughs> uh, excuse me, I'm really mussing this thing up. He said Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and proceed him to the other side of the sea, while he dismissed the crowds. After doing so, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When it was evening, he was there alone. Meanwhile, the boat, already a few miles offshore, was being tossed about by the waves, for the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, he came toward them, walking on the, on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. And once Jesus spoke to them, take courage, not I, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter said to him in reply, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. Peter got out of the boat and began to walk on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw how strong the wind was, he became afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said, Oh, you little faith, why did you doubt? After they got into the boat, the wind died down. And those who were in the boat did him harm and saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Boy, that's a powerful text, doesn't it? I mean, we... There's been a million two hundred and fourteen thousand versions of the jokes with regard to Peter walking on the water, but if you look at this, a great symbol of of the church at the time of Saint Matthew, and it's the church of this day, and that is the turbulence of life itself. That storm on the water is the storm of life itself. Can you imagine what those early apostles went through? Saying. How real, I'll show you this, how real is the Christ who came to them in their mind? Or was it just a ghost? In the turbulence of that water, the turbulence of that, that storm, they were in the boat and helpless. You see, they're helpless. And that's when Peter asks if he can transcend the violence, if he would just hear in the command of Christ and follow it. But even Peter, he's so human. He's so perfectly human. Even he, for a moment, doubts it. In, he plunges into the depth of the water. He descends into the chaos. I think doubt leads to chaos, you see. But Christ raises him up, holds his hand, and pulls him out of the water. And they put him in the boat. He, they return to the boat. And as long as they're, the boat is the church. As long as they're in the boat, they are safe because Christ is in the boat with them. That's a model, a theme that runs throughout. That's a very common theme. The bark of Peter, the storm, the, the storm in the earth, the storm in the, on the water. It's life. And especially at that time when it was turbulent and violent. See, I think why I said before is that my New England experience is because I've been out in the water. When my father, went, when I was a boy, my father and I were rowing a rowboat, and we went out and the storm came up. And I remember my father rowing against the boat, against the boat, rowed it against the wind and the helplessness you feel. When human strength is not enough, the storm is bigger than you are. Yeah, I remember we tied to a, to a post, a, a lobster post, lobster pot. They had poles in the water. And that's the only thing we had, and our life jackets. It's very important, very powerful experience in my life because I was, I was frightened in a different kind of way. And my father knew we were in danger, serious danger. We didn't have life jackets. We had uh, life preservers, uh, cushions. And he tied his cushion to me and my both cushions. I had both cushions. So if, the, if we had capsized, my father would have drowned. 
And that really had a, as it turned out, somebody came along and they got us in. They came on an outboard and they, they, pulled, they hauled us in. My father bought an outboard motor the following Christmas. So it was 1954, 1955, around there. Thing. I was about 13 or 14. Never forgot that. That was a powerful experience of my father's love for me. Think of God's love for us to give you his life jacket. See? Think of Christ, okay? As it were, see, the life jacket, the, the, the safety cushion, you see? I remember when the monastery, when I finally moved away and started to begin years later, three or four or five years later, when I began to, when I became a passionist and I began to contemplate the, uh, the, the, the Christ, especially the crucified Christ, and the, and the love of the Father, I began to identify God the Father with my own Father. And I began to see what my Father, how I began to understand God as a compassionate Father who gives away his Son, gives away his life for his sons and daughters. It was a transformative experience for me after so. When I think of the Father, God the Father, I think of my Father, and I think of the boat. I think of rocking and rolling out there and virtually helpless, and he ties his life jacket to me, his safety cushion to me, his flotation cushion to me. He made sure I survived. After that, I stopped ever fearing God, fearing him, but I rather revered him with the same love I have for my Father, and I want to honor him with the quality of my life. I want to be faithful to my father, not out of fear, but out of honor. It's deep within my, in my own family tradition. It was interesting, when I left home and got ordained, okay, right there, my mother said to me, never dishonor our family name. That was the only command I ever got, never dishonor our family name. That runs very deep in me because I love my parents, I, even though I didn't understand when I was a boy's typical teenager. But looking back with reverence and, and, and regard because of their enormous faithful fidelity, their act, active fidelity for me and my brother. And I so when I look at my father, I see with that type of powerful reverence, well, that transfers as I think of God the same way and the same way. I'm not speaking very well right now. But I don't, try, I don't distrust for one second the fidelity of God because I also know what fidelity is because I saw it and experienced it in my parents and my father. And I ask only that I not do disservice to that name, the family name and the divine name. I hope I never betray the church. I never betray Christ. I'm a sinful man, but hopefully not a betrayer because it's abhorrent to me to betray my own family. Boy, you have no idea what that means. None. Betrayals, it's the unthinkable sin. To turn myself, turn against those who have loved me. My family, the divine family. Didn't say I'm perfect. I'm a sinful man and I beg for forgiveness. But I hope I have never dishonored my family or dishonored the church or dishonored Christ and his father through the Holy Spirit. I hope I have been a good son. Flawed, but a faithful son who loves his father, who loves his mother, who loves the church, who loves God in Christ through the Holy Spirit. I mean that. If you had to be in that boat, you'd get the message. If you were in that boat with me and my father, you'd understand exactly what I just said.